Yeah, welcome, Malcolm. It's nice to see you. Um, uh, thank you very much for the report, which I uh, enjoyed reading. Uh, it was a while ago now, last September, I think I read it through, but I've looked at it um, briefly again today. Um, could we start by just saying just a few words about yourself, just an intro introduction to you, and then go on to five minutes or so about the report? So that if we could start off like that, that'd be great. Thanks. Right. Uh, yes, so I'm Dr. Malcolm Morgan. I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute for Transport Studies in Leeds. Uh, I'm a civil engineer by original training, but my research is uh, focused on, I use a lot of geospatial methods and uh, GIS to look at uh, decarbonisation and energy demand in transport and sort of urban sector. And I've been working at Leeds now for about seven years. Doing, doing this kind of stuff. Uh, so the, the report itself was called uh, Uncut, Understanding uh, Changing Car Use Over Time. Um, and although we largely focused on car ownership uh, because of some of the limitations of the data that we had. And what we were trying to understand were places where car ownership was in decline and whether there were any lessons to be drawn from that that could be generalized or scaled up as, as a way of reducing overall car ownership and use and leading to decarbonization of the transport sector. Uh, so my, my sort of motivation for, for looking into this is it was that it, it's been well known for a long time that car ownership is, is lower in inner cities and increases as you go out to the suburbs and then out to rural areas. And, and that's fine, we, we've known that, but the, the solution for, say, rural areas isn't to turn them into inner cities. No, we, so it, it's an observation of something that is true, but it's not a, a guide to how we could fix it. So I was interested as well, could we find, say, some suburbs or some rural areas where, where car use and ownership were declining? Because that might then suggest some change that we could make to, to um, other places that would, would reduce car ownership. Um, and I, I managed to get from the Department of Transport some very locally specific data on, on car ownership over a, a long time period, almost 20 years. Uh, and so I'd had a quick look at this data and I thought, well, there's, there's something there. There's, there's, there's some changes occurring. But uh, I, I wanted to really dig into that data in more detail and see if there was anything useful in the data. Uh, and so I applied to the Decarbonate Seed Corn Fund for a little bit of money to, to give me a bit of time to, to sort of really dig into this data and see if there was anything useful in it. So it was, it was something of a data exploration uh, project rather than having a, a concrete uh, sort of research question to, to answer. Um, but we were, were looking for this idea of, of places where car ownership was in decline. And we, we found a sort of bunch of sort of fairly interesting things. So the, the national trend is that car ownership is, is increasing. But when you break it down at, at a local level, you find lots of different patterns going on. So in, in big urban areas, I think things like centre of London, centre of Birmingham, uh, car ownership has, has been fluctuating, but is, is, has largely been flat over the last 20 years. And almost all the growth in car ownership is occurring in the suburbs and rural areas. So that the, there's, there's immediately, there's, it, it's not just that car ownership is higher in rural areas, it's growing in rural areas. And in cities, it's, it's stagnating or in a lot of places slightly declining. Uh, and so that, you know, that's interesting. It doesn't tell us why, but you know, that, that divergence is occurring. Is, is interesting. And we also uh, looked at various sort of geodemographic -dem groups. So this is sort of clustering places by, by their physical characteristics, but also their populations. Uh, and sort of unsurprisingly, you see groups, there's a, there's a cluster called cosmopolitan student neighborhoods. Um, and as you can imagine, students are quite a low car ownership owning group. And, and so their uh, car ownership in those areas is low and declining. Uh, but there's another group called struggling uh, renters who are, are also one of the lowest uh, car ownership groups, but they're growing. And, and so that's interesting. That says something about car dependence and people who are on low incomes are being forced into greater car ownership or choosing greater car ownership. We don't know from this data, but the, the, there are diverging trends going on. And so uh, what I did was I sort of did some statistical methods to, to pass over these many thousands of uh, areas 
and categorize the ones. And what I was really interested in places where uh, the number of cars per person were in, in decline. Uh, and the reason I wanted to look at cars per person was if you just looked at number of cars, it might have been the reason that the number of cars declined was they say there was a housing estate and then it was demolished. And so all the people went and they took their cars with them. But that that's not generalizable. We can't just demolish everyone's houses as a solution to climate change. So I wanted to look at places where in some way it suggested that the people were choosing to get rid of their cars. And there weren't many of them of, of the 35,000 roughly LSOAs in, in England and Wales, only about 200 seem to have this ca characteristic of declining car ownership per person. And then I used uh, satellite photography from Google Earth, which has a, has a really handy feature that lets you just sort of run a little slider back through time and view uh, different years of, of satellite photography to try and look for changes in these areas. And so I spent a long time just flicking backwards and forwards between different photographs, trying to go, what was different? And, and the, the, the short answer to what we found was the best way to reduce car ownership is to build dense housing in existing urban areas. So we found lots of examples where um, new blocks of flats had gone in, or it, not necessarily high rise, but things like low rise flats and terraced housing, that, that kind of thing's fairly dense. Um, in an existing urban area, in increase the population without increasing the number of cars, and in some cases, uh, decreasing the number of cars. And we saw that that could also happen to a lesser extent in suburban areas. Um, but always sort of a doubling down on places that, that already work somewhere where you, you could get to work or you could get to the shops without a car. And so putting more people into those kinds of areas, it, it seems that they don't bring their cars with them. We also found quite a few interesting red herrings. So there was the place where uh, they would built a big nursing home, big increase in the population, no additional cars for fairly obvious reasons, again, not generalizable. Um, another one that was interesting is we found places where new sort of suburbs had been built. And at first you see uh, an increase in cars and population gradually as these big sort of housing states are built over time and people are moving in as they're building more houses. Um, and, but then at some point when the house building stopped, the number of cars stopped increasing, but the population kept increasing. And when we unpacked that, we found it was basically young couples were moving into these, these new housing estates. Uh, and at some point, the, the, the housing estate filled up with young couples. And then those young couples started having children. And so the population kept increasing, but it was the sort of number of cars per family was, was staying roughly steady. Uh, and we saw sort of several examples and things like that. Um, we also saw examples sort of new, new housing estates that were on the face of it, quite car dominated. So if you have a sort of little look around on, on the satellite photos or Google Street View and things, you'd see a lot of cars and, and it looked like quite a car dominated place. But they're also quite dense. Um, a lot of these places had, uh, they maybe didn't have uh, garages. They just had a single car parking space in front of each town. Um, and because of that, there seemed to be a sort of soft limit of one car per household. And, and those kinds of housing, they, they didn't reduce car ownership, but they, they maintained car ownership at a below average rate. So again, this, this sort of example of the type of housing, where it is, how it's built, being really influential on the, on the rate of car ownership. And then the last thing we did is we looked at changing car ownership around new train and tram stations. The idea being there, there's a significant improvement in public transport, and that might persuade people to, to get rid of their car. And that was a really mixed picture in, in, in dense inner city areas where car ownership was already low. We saw declines uh, in, in car ownership after the stations opened, although it wasn't entirely clear whether the, the station opening was the cause of that, because in, in several cases, the decline had occurred before the stations opened, but that could have been um, sort of preemptive or anticipatory. You know, if, if you know a new station is, is going to open in a location soon, a developer might start choosing to build boxer flats 
Uh, and so it, we, we didn't have enough time to unpack exactly what was going on, but certainly some declines associated with new stations. But in other areas, particularly in sort of rural areas, uh, it seemed to make no difference at all and that the car ownership was increasing and continued to increase after the stations opened. So a really kind of mixed picture there, but quite interesting in terms of lessons about whether improving public transport is a solution to getting people out of their cars. Um, and it seemed from, from this very initial analysis of this data that urban planning and, and home densities and things are much more strongly related with changes in ownership of cars than, than transport policies, which, which I found very interesting and something I'd like to explore more in the future. Mm, that was really interesting and uh, you managed to get a lot into what's what really quite a small small amount of money and mm. uh, um, a fairly condensed report so it's really it's a really interesting piece of work and as you said there's a lot more you can see where it could lead to there's a lot of additional work that, that could really provide a sort of rich um a rich resource for trying to understand what we need to do um there are a few things in there immediate questions one is that from what you've said there and also from my reading of the report and, and painting it in a very simple way, basically make it difficult to park and you get a lower car density. It seems to, you know, that usually say if you, build, if you build modern houses with just one drive space, then that tends to mean you're limited to one car. It's harder to park somewhere else. Um, in these sort of denser urban uh, um, areas you were talking about, there was even lower car density. So it, it did seem to me that there was a, a sort of a clear message, I'm, or am I being too simplistic there? A clear message to planners that the denser it is, uh, yeah. the, and the harder it is to park, the less car ownership you will have. I think I, I think you're right. I did. I'm a I'm a little cautious because the the, the way we did this is very difficult to establish causality. So to say that like the things we observed definitely caused the changes in car, car ownership. And, and there are some other limitations with the data. So we, one of the frustrating things with the data we had is we couldn't distinguish between private cars and company cars. Um, and, and so that there were some odd things we saw where it, what it looked like is a, a business had moved and taken lots of cars with it. And, and that, that kind of stuff sort of messed up our, our statistics in a way that we couldn't really filter out nicely but it, it definitely seems that like the the more the, the more sort of anti-car policies like removing parking were more effective than the kind of pro alternatives like better public transport or better walking and cycling infrastructure and so you, in reality you probably want a mix of both um but yeah from from what what we found i'd, I'd be quite pessimistic that just say building lots of alternatives to the car would actually be particularly effective at reducing car ownership, mm. certainly to the, to the amount that we need to meet climate yeah. targets. I mean, that, that, I think that's a, that's a true story that we're reluctant to get, or we're reluctant to take in many areas, that providing alternatives is never enough. It's an essential part of, of making changes, but you've got to somehow close down the incumbents. And we've, we've found that with, with energy. You know, you look at, we put in renewable power, but we just produce, we just use as much oil and gas. We now use renewable power as well as oil and gas, and and so you, you, that's you've got, you've got to somehow close down the incumbents as well as provide those alternatives, which seems to be the, or at least it's one way you could read the observational um, findings that you have from your report. Mm -hmm. um, you, you made the other comment there, um, which I thought was quite interesting about uh, young couples would move in, they'd have children. Obviously, the population would go up, but car density would remain the same. But obviously, the children can't drive. Um, so from a, from a, who, who's able to drive point of view, presumably uh, we, we, you weren't able to see any real change there, were you? Because if you took the children out of the spec, out of the calculation, was there, there was no real change. I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then it was sort of cut. So this was one of the conclusions of the report was that, that cars per adult would have been a better metric to use than cars per person. Yeah. Um, and maybe even sort of focusing on, say, a working age adult or something to filter out pensioners who uh, have a different dynamic um, and students. Um, and so that, that was unfortunately something we only discovered once we'd done the analysis. And so like, we didn't have, have the time to go back and redo it all um, mm. with, with slightly different metrics. But that, that I think is something, uh, an area for further research. What would have been nice to also be able to do would have been cars per household. 
Um, but there aren't annual data on the number of households in, in small areas, which was, I was a little bit surprised. I thought someone would have, would have produced this data, but we get a count of households with each census, um, but that's only every 10 years. Whereas to, to, to map these sort of gradual changes over time, we needed annual data and there's annual counts of population, but not per household. Um, and so another avenue might be to try and get sort of historical address data as a way of counting the number of houses or um, getting data on house building to, to, to kind of go, well, we knew in, in the last census there were this many houses and three houses have been built in the meantime, so we can now make a, an estimate of how many houses there are this year. Mm. Um, but it, yeah, that it, it gets quite complicated and quite fiddly to, and you, you, you spend you spend a lot of time trying to count houses when what you really wanted to study were uh, cars um, and so yeah there's there's some other avenues of, of further work that I'm, I'm interested in in building up these long time series data sets that some of them are directly about um, transport so for example better data on public transport service and how that changes because again counting stations is a really crude measure it would be better to count things like frequency of service because yes. it might be the station isn't new but the service has got much better or the station is new but the service is terrible and so nobody uses it mm. um, and so so building up these kind of contextual things how many homes what, what's been built what's the public transport like you know uh, what's happening with incomes and things you know are people getting richer or poorer that probably matters as well um, and so I, you could imagine there's, there's a whole series of things, things you could build up and then rerun this analysis with a lot more context. Mm. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that was obviously one of the limits on the, on the sort of observational data a lot that you were using. I was Because I was thinking from that, can you do say anything about how um, averages are changed by some some families particularly in some of the maybe some of the more suburban communities where some families might have a lot of cars and other ones much less so it could be that if you i'm just thinking about areas that i know that are sort of quite mixed where you get quite a lot of terraced houses and then just in the outskirts you, or just a little bit outside the main town center there's quite a lot of large houses where we have far more cars and when you average them out it might you know give you quite a that's a very different view than if you if you could understand not the median or the mode um sort of levels of car ownership yes uh, yeah um like type type of housing probably matters um it, that plays a little bit into sort of density in that you know when you have people have bigger houses with more space around them for cars it, it means the population <coughs> density decreases the the lower super output areas that we use for this analysis are a little tricky when you're thinking about density because they uh, so the the lowest super output areas cover the whole country so that means that when you say have a big lake or a forest or something or a park that is in an lsoa so you often find one where there's like a little bit of dense housing and then a big park and if you just calculate number of people per area of lsoa you conclude it's a low density place but really it's a, a high density place with a, a low density place stuck together yeah i remember um, seeing that well, i think i saw that in one of your plots i remember in the report i think it was that was obvious there Yes, so, uh, so there's, there's, all, there's a lot of little complications in what seemed like a very simple task. Um, and yeah, we discovered all, all the problems as, as we worked through the project. Um, yeah. But there, there are potentially things we could do to try and mitigate some of that. Yeah. Um, could you add, or is there any way to add any sort of socioeconomic data? Uh, is, is it available on postcode basis and that sort of that sort of thing or not, do you know? So again, there are there are things you could add there's there's stuff in the census so when we did the the that we clustered by sort of socio-demographic characteristics that that was based on the 2011 census that kind of stuff isn't updated so frequently um and so yeah we're capturing how sort of the socioeconomic stuff is changing on a year by year basis is 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 a lot harder there are some things like acorn that i think do sort of postcode classifications but they're not always like sometimes you could you have to buy this data and you can get this year's data but you go well i want the acorn classifications from 2002 and the main, they don't exist or they're not available and so tracking down all this historical data is is quite a challenge especially the the further back you go um, but we need, you know, we know people aren't changing their, their sort of driving and car ownership behaviours sort of every six months. These are sort of long term trends. And so we mm. do need to look back a long time um, and sort of 20 years now. I think that's that's a long enough time period that we should be able to capture some interesting changes and hopefully 
sort of translate those into better outcomes for the next 20 years. Yes, yeah, yeah. In the area I work in, 20 years seems so long, mm. given where the emissions are. That yeah, I think we hopefully we can get some changes more rapidly than that. Yes, uh, well, uh, certainly to, to start them, but uh, you know, certainly things like you know, large scale sort of house building. Mm -hmm. this takes time um and and if, if that is the way we we get the change we, you know we need to start now to, to exactly yes no, exactly um you, you made the comment about uh you were you sort of differentiated between cities suburb, suburban areas and rural areas and you noted that some cities where car ownership is relatively low for a whole suite of reasons but not not insignificantly um it's quite difficult to to have a car in those areas simply because of, of parking and other reasons um but what do you mean there by suburban areas? I'm trying to think in Manchester where I, uh, I work, are you talking about areas that are just four or five miles out of the city centre? Or you, uh, would they be classified as suburban or do they still classify as city? So where, where, do, where does that actually... That so, so, I mean, we, we were using the Office of National Statistics, which divides um, places into seven categories on their rural urban uh, uh, classification so that that was the technical answer but the the suburban areas are the areas on on the edge of cities which are are traditionally lower density so you're thinking more likely detached and semi-detached houses with gardens rather than the the inner city areas which are more likely to have terraced houses and flats and things and be closer to to the center um, mm. but the office of national statistics also distinguish between uh the the size of, of the urban area so they, they have sort of urban areas in large conurbations, so places like London and Manchester and, and Birmingham, and then urban areas in, in smaller towns, so, so you might somewhere like a Milton Keynes, which is urban, um, but is a different sort of urban mm. to central London, uh, and we saw different trends with, with those, those kind of areas. Yeah, I'm just done. obviously we, we always relate these to places we, that we know, and I'm thinking about the Manchester where you can quite clearly see that some of the areas um, have a lot of particularly some of the slightly poor areas have a lot of terraced houses but the same distance out a little just a few just maybe a one mile further out um, on a radial in a radial perspective from the center you'll find areas where it's got lots of 1930s semis that are slightly slightly wealthy areas um and they're they're obviously got access to to somewhere to park their cars and but they're all actually the same sort of distance from the center they've all got radial bus networks into the center but quite different car ownership so i was wondering how that you know that's just thinking there that that suburban city split may well depend quite a lot, as you were saying, something like Milton Keynes, but in a lot of other cities, perhaps it will depend a lot on other factors as to really where they, quite how you classify them. Yes, yeah, and so it's certainly more complex than just sort of distance from the city centre. Um, you know, it, it's the type of housing, it's the type yeah. of road layouts and things. So, you know, there are there are very car dependent road layouts where it's you know everywhere's divided up by big trunk roads that you can't cross if you're you're walking or cycling there's lots of cul-de-sacs and things so even journeys that are short uh, so as the crow flies have to be long journeys because you have to drive out of the neighborhood around mm. and, and, and back in whereas you know sort of like more traditional cities um which have nice sort of grids or, or deformed grids which are very permeable to taking lots of different routes and they, they shorten trips um and so definitely you know that that's another thing we could add in some sort of classification of, of the road structure and and almost certainly you would see that like more car dependent road layouts encourage more car dependent lifestyles yeah okay um thinking about this thinking about this in relation to emissions and um broader sustainability concerns so your data is all about ownership and as you say it'd be nice to get information about usage as well you, you make that point particularly in the report um and clearly it would be but it's not going to be as straightforward i would have thought to get that usage data but nevertheless um although there tends to be a focus on usage relating to car ownership actually the cars themselves particularly if we're going to go to electrical vehicles uh you know they, they do embed a lot of um ecological challenges let's put it that way there's a lot of materials a lot of energy um in those as well so although it would be nice to have the usage data actually thinking about how we can reduce ownership not just because of the usage but actually because of the materials in their production is presumably that's quite a quite a useful thing to be doing as well i know some of the other work going on in leeds looking at things like rental schemes on the outskirts of cities um or suburban areas 
So perhaps your work can help fit into some of that, maybe. Um, about how do we, again, that housing, how does that encourage a move away from cars and perhaps then alternative um, modes of ownership? Uh, so I presume you've, you've discussed that, no doubt, with some of your other Leeds colleagues, cause, colleagues, because a lot of this work's gone on in Leeds. Yes, yeah, there's a lot going on. So we've got a, another project that's just starting, funded by Administrative, oh, what's it, Administrative Data Research UK, uh, and we've partnered with the Department of Transport. And what, what we're doing there is, so it's, it's sort of the similar data, but coming from a, another angle. And we're trying to link the, the car registration data to the MOT history. And so every every year you have to take your car for an MOT. And one of the things they record with that is what the, the how much miles you've driven on the odometer. And yeah. so if you can compare this year's MOT with last year's MOT, you know how much they've driven per year. And then if we can link that car to a, a registered keeper in a specific location, one doing that once for one person doesn't tell you much very interesting, but if we can do it for every car and do that over time, we mm. can build up sort of records of average mileage per year per LSOA. And, and that would give us a, a, an idea of how usage is changing over time. Um, and so that project has just started and there are lots of complications with, with linking all these big complicated data sets together. But the hope is within sort of two or three years time, we might be able to, do, to publish data, which gives you sort of, oh, you know, people on this street drive an average of so many miles per year. And that has increased 5% over the last decade or something. And, and, and so then we could go back and look at things like train stations and go, oh, car ownership didn't change very much, but car use did change substantially. Yeah. Um, and then to your what your point about the like the emissions and things from building the cars and the benefit of less cars, even if, if they're used less. I, I see it as a bit of a two stage thing. If somebody's using a car every single day, th there's always going to be a strong economic case to actually own that car, because if you're you're renting that car or car sharing it, you're, you're going to hit sort of inconvenience and cost because of that. So th there's an aspect of you need to get car use down to a level where you're not using it all the time and then it's quite compelling for people to say well rather than having all these sort of fixed costs of owning a car offload those to a shared car of some model and that that reduces your money but because you have access to a car whenever you need you don't have to worry about the fact that you don't own a car and i think a lot of people they they own a car because there's that one journey a month or a year that they really need the car. You know, you can think of things like, oh, I need the big SUV because I tow the caravan up to the Lake District once a year. And then, then because they have the car and it's on the drive and it's easy, they then choose to drive to work every day. Um, yeah. And and so to, to, to get them into a state where they don't own that car, you would have to one say, well, you're not going to drive to work every day. You're going to use the bus or the train or, or cycle or whatever the alternative is for that person in that situation. Uh, and then the you can still go on your, your camping holiday because I can guarantee you there's a there's the right kind of car share car it's just around the corner. You can have it whenever you want. Yes. And, and that's yeah. how you get to, to, to like the no car state. Um, but if you tell people, you know, oh, you just can't have your car, they'll go, well, I need it for work. And, and you'll never get to that real reason about the, the annual camping holiday. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think I think that's very true. That, And also, I think this is where the, the, the sort of belief that somehow the price will always drive this. I mean, the, the, the cost already for a lot of the people who are using their cars is incredibly high. But for quite a lot of people, it's a cost that they've simply, they, they don't need to calculate because they, they have sufficient anyway, and they're prepared to accept that. I mean, you think about the, the amount of time, the space it takes up in your house, the, you know, the, the, the value of the land in the house, then the value of the land in the city that you might drive to where it's parked, you know, that, that, that actual market value of that space in a city or, or a town, um, let alone all of the costs of the of the actual road network and everything else. So sort of the economics of this, I think, are, uh, um, are not why why we do something. There's always this belief that we do something because it's economically rational. And I think there's something much more culturally embedded, as you're sort of alluding to here, culturally embedded in how we use things, how we do things in our lives that we often then sort of post hoc rationalize as somehow it's economically the best thing to do. But often it's nothing like that at all. Yeah, no, I agree. I think if you really think about it, cars are deeply irrational, but we've built a system where we, you, most people have to drive 
Mm. Uh, and and so you know we, we embed them in the system. Um, but there's some really interesting work coming out of America, particularly looking at, at that in their system they're more reliant on property taxes. Um, but in, in their sort of low density suburban sprawl, which is very car dependent, uh, that they you don't get a lot of tax per acre of of land because there are only a few properties on mm. the land. Uh, and because everything is so spaced out because they've got you know huge car parking areas and big wide roads and things uh, they have to build a lot of infrastructure and maintain a lot of infrastructure because you need more road per person more sewage pipe per person more telecoms cable per person uh, and so that they're, they're showing that really that the the low density car dependent suburbs are hugely expensive for cities and they're being subsidized yeah. by the, the dense inner city cores yes. which have lots of lots of residents and lots of businesses paying lots of tax with very little infrastructure uh, and the great irony in america is often those inner cities are, are are the poorer neighborhoods and the suburbs are the richer neighborhoods and so there's this very clear flow of subsidy from from poor neighborhoods to rich neighborhoods mm. because of the car uh, and in the UK, the, the taxation system is is different. And so the, 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 the patterning wouldn't be so clear. But those kind of principles of lower density means more infrastructure per person, which means more cost for society. Um, and that the car is the driver of that. And the solution is to densify, to contract the city and provide alternatives, I think, still holds. Yeah, yeah. I think I think probably maybe a bit cynically. Typically, subsidies do actually go from the poorer to the wealthier. I think we we like to think it was the other way around, but probably even the UK. When you look at people who are, who often aren't so wealthy, may own a car, they pay their road tax, but they don't drive very often. But the people who drive a lot are probably the middle class and the wealthier people who use that road infrastructure that you're all paying into. Mm. So that's a subsidy in a certain direction, let alone the the environmental subsidies as well. Yeah. Um, so w where do you hope to go from this? Uh, with this business, do you, do you have any plans of where you can take it next? So, so the the short term is is the the cars project and linking up yeah. this MOT data to get to get the usage because that that I think is is will add a large amount of nuance. Um, it's also likely that we will we will get more about ownership. Um, so that the what we had was just a number of cars, and no other contextual information. So it would be nice to 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 break that down into types of car. Uh, fuel type as well, you know, where are the EVs, where are the petrol cars, uh, size of car, you know, where, uh, SUVs and and unpack all of that in, in a lot more detail. Um, and, you know, over the next sort of year or so, hopefully we will we will get that data and we'll start to, to produce the analysis. Um, and, and the hope is we, we will take the first crack at, at doing the analysis and publishing the results. But the hope is that eventually that this might turn into a, an open data set that's available to all researchers uh, and may even become something that the Department of Transport takes over and starts publishing annually mm. long into the future. Um, and so that, that would be a big step up in the quality of the sort of small area data we have about transport. Yeah. And then, as I mentioned, I want, I want to link that with as many contextual data sets as possible. So I'm working on a bit of a, a side project, looking at uh, historical public transport timetables to see if we could start to say, well, like, what's the frequency of the bus service on this street and how has it changed over the last 20 years? Because um, I suspect some of the reason we see sort of improvements in urban areas uh, or it decreases in car ownership um, are, are related to better public transport, but not necessarily new, like harder infrastructure. It's just like it um, changed the timetables and the, the bus runs twice as frequently or it runs mm. for a longer period of the day. Um, and, and capturing those those variations in time, but also in, in place, um, I suspect will explain a lot. So for example, if you look at uh, London, uh, inner London has about one car for every seven people. Yeah. Whereas in Leeds, it's more like one car for every two people. Yeah. So, you know, th there's a reason for that. Uh, and then if you try and measure the, like the, the frequency of public transport uh, or, the, or the connectivity by, public transport the the worst connected places in london are better connected by public transport than the best connected places yep. anywhere outside london 
Yeah, so you always see that whenever you go to London. It just, it's, it's a it's a completely different city to the rest of the UK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you see that it's not not just the the quantity of the public transport, but often also the quality of the public transport as well. Um, and I, I was thought, you know, even basic information like what to, when, it, how late is the bus? I mean, the bus shouldn't be late, but in the UK, they all seem to be. So you can have that information on your mobile phone, and that thing that makes it more attractive to know when you go to the bus stop. Now those you know, simple things like that, as you say, sort of soft infrastructure as well as the um, hard infrastructure. One final qu- comment: think about the this the obsession, in, in my view, about um, trying to put in charging points for EVs and in cities, which is sub- substituting IC engine cars for EV cars without really thinking about well, we really want transport rather than just necessarily a swap of one for one. Um, from what you're saying is that in the denser areas where car ownership is lower, we need perhaps think less about charging points, but more, you know, as you're saying, the rural environment where the car ownership is higher. And that also gives us a, a sort of clear sort of planning framework for how we build the houses, what sort of houses we build, but then also that, that charging network. So my concern is at the moment, we could be rushing out to put in EV chargers all over the place to tick various boxes. But actually in doing that, you're locking in ongoing mm-hmm. car use, which is actually quite unsustainable in lots of regards and maybe not very suitable for a lot of the, the dense places, your denser places that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I see a, a clear divide between places that have on-street and off-street parking. And like largely, if, if people have off-street parking, they're putting their, their EV charger in the garage or on the drive. Mm. And, you know, maybe there's some subsidy to help people do that. But that's very different from the process where people don't have off-street parking and we're putting in sort of community or, or often privately owned charge points in, in the street. But for me, like if you look at where are the streets that don't have on off street parking, they're often things like dense terraced housing built in Victorian times or in the 1930s. In a, you know, these houses were built before the age of mass car ownership uh, and people used to live there without owning a car. So oh, yeah. these places clearly used to work without a car. And we should be thinking much more about like, which of the streets are actually rather than thinking of transitioning them to electric vehicles, we transition them to car-free neighbourhoods. Because, you know, if, if, if they worked in the 1930s, um, and, you know, there's a, a lot of houses were built in the 1930s, and often, you know, they're not even terraced houses or flats. They're, hmm. they're sort of semi-detached with gardens, but, you know, they're quite nice housing that's still attractive and sells well. But they were built pre-car, so they worked pre-car, uh, and you look certainly around sort of West Yorkshire, where, where I live and work, all of the towns and cities in, in West Yorkshire had s- substantial tram networks into those 1930 suburbs. And in, and in some cases, the suburbs were built by the tram companies. But now the trams are gone and they're mm-hmm. replaced by a, a flaky bus service. And the, the, the road that was once a tram street has been widened to a, like a two lane trunk road so we can fit more cars in, which means you can't cycle and the public transport gets stuck in, in yeah. congestion. And, and you go, well, I understand why these places don't work as car free areas anymore. But, you know, maybe we can learn from the past. Maybe we don't just roll everything back to what it was in the 1930s but think about places that could be made into places that work without the car mm. rather than just going we electrify the cars that are there yeah no it seems much more sensible there's obviously equity dimensions in all of this as well so we don't have a you know the, the wealthy areas still can have their cars and the poor parts can't so there are those sorts of issues we have to really think through but it does seem ridiculous that we had um we had areas that dense, relatively dense areas around our cities and our towns where people lived, worked, and travelled perfectly well in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. And of course, going further back, my local town, Glossop, is almost all stone terrace built, probably most of it before the 19, much of it before the 1930s, and they're still there today. Um, they worked; they were functioning towns. You could also turn almost turn around and say, now they're not functioning from a transport point of view. They're they're chaotic from a transport point of view. So we've gone from functioning transport to not functioning transport and we're now trying to electrify to maintain not functioning transport it's a bizarre sort of system we're not prepared to sort of step back and and learn lessons from history not we play history but learn lessons from it so anyway um i think that's probably everything covered i mean it's been, it's a fascinating report um i look forward to any follow-up work um for me particularly who focuses on the emissions side 
uh, and the broader ecological challenges, the, the sooner we can have this sort of data available, the sooner we can start to inform planners to do things that are more sensible rather than you know, lock in planning practices that are going to make things more problematic in the future, the better. So um, you know, there's an urgency issue to this sort of work being funded and, and getting out there in the, in the public domain. So uh, thanks very much for the report. I really, so I really enjoyed it. Um, and I hope it gets the coverage it deserves.